Caution, the show you're about to see is headed for disaster. Hey everyone, Pushing Up Roses here, and I am pretty happy with today's topic. I love tales of the strange and bizarre curiosities and oddities as conveyed in shows like Unsolved Mysteries, or on the fictional side, The Twilight Zone and Night Gallery. But what if we combined the intrigue of Unsolved Mysteries and imagination of The Twilight Zone? What would we get? we would get Beyond Belief, Fact or Fiction, starring Jonathan Frakes. You may be somewhat familiar with the show because about a year ago, it became subject to internet memes. The video, Jonathan Frakes telling you you're wrong for 47 seconds, now has over 2 million views. And you know why? You know why that many people watched it? Because this show is great. It's no wonder it became a cult classic. We do display this as a trophy, but was it really the crow that killed him? Observe, a perfectly shaped square. I can watch Frakes talk about bizarre things and ask me invasive questions all day long, so this video is dedicated to Beyond Belief Fact or Fiction. Let's talk about why it's so captivating, so charming, and so bad, actually. The show ran from 1997 to 2002, though episodes were released sporadically over the five-year span. Even though all of the memes feature Jonathan Frakes of Star Trek fame, the first season was hosted by James Brolin, also known as Barbara Streisand's husband. The next three seasons were all Commander Riker. Even something as simple as an autograph could be worth uh, Patrick Stewart. The format is really simple. You're told five stories, all that are meant to defy logic and test your suspension of disbelief. Some are based on actual accounts and some are fabricated. At the end of each episode, Frakes will go over each story and tell you which ones were, quote, real, and I say that word very loosely, and which ones were made up. Pretty basic stuff. We've seen shows like this before with the dramatic reenactments and intense voiceover. We live in a world where the real and the unreal live side by side. But this one was especially addicting. I think I watched all four seasons in just a few days. Every episode starts with some terrible computer graphics, followed by Jonathan Frakes strutting onto the set. He then typically presents us with a visual illusion. Sometimes they're pretty cool, and sometimes they're this. Well, my mind is blown, how about you? Also, this is one of the illusions. I love this trick, even though Frakes' face is terrifying. After the illusion, bam, right away, we cut to Frakes asking a question that correlates to the theme of the episode. For example, there's an episode dedicated to things that happened on Friday the 13th. There is an episode about technology, illness, monsters, disasters, you name it, there's an episode for it. <laughs> Oh, for goodness frakes. I do wish the transition from the illusion presentation to giving us the theme of the show wasn't so jarring, but sometimes it's worth it to see frakes feign excitement about some of these lame novelties, and the way he hosts this show is everything. He is so charming and so engaging. I didn't really enjoy season one with James Brolin. He was a little too laid back and seemed uninterested in the stories being told. Frakes comes across like he really wants you to think about these tales. After he lays out the theme of the show, we get into the stories, each ranging from five to seven minutes, give or take a few. If you like dramatic reenactments in the old Unsolved Mysteries show, you will probably like how they're done here. They're hokey, dramatic, the acting is questionable, and the stories are out there. In fact, I really like the fictional stories contributed by author Robert Traylons. They remind me of a slightly more serious Are You Afraid of the Dark and a less serious Twilight Zone, though I must warn you, Traylons was kind of a weird character and I don't feel comfortable recommending his older work for obvious reasons. He did have a particular interest in the supernatural and wrote a lot of sci-fi stories, some of which were adapted for this show, and he also conducted interviews with the people who were involved with the real events. The story entitled The Stalker is based on first-hand research conducted by author Robert Traylons. The fictional episodes are wild. The point of the show is to deceive the viewer, so the stories need to be slightly believable, even if the premise itself is a stretch, but sometimes there isn't any nuance, and those are my favorite entries. Some of these are just so debunkable right away, but I just can't get enough. This episode is about mannequins, and it was a treat. Why does this one look like Danny Elfman? Two men working at a high-end store have jobs setting up mannequin displays. Gerald has been with the company for a long time and Craig works under him, studying to become a chief decorator. Craig has ulterior motives though. Wait, there's a pun in here somewhere. I can feel it. Interior motives? 
No, forget it. He goes to their boss and tells him Gerald isn't ready for an important event and claims his displays are prehistoric and need modernizing. I have never seen so much drama about window dressing. Gerald gets fired because why trust an experienced designer when you can just trust some random punk? Gerald is angry when Craig starts dismantling the mannequins. What are you doing to my troops? He tells him he'll be sorry for taking his job and hurting his family. His family as in his mannequins. Yeah. When Craig goes to show the new display to the boss, it's not there. He thinks Gerald sabotaged it even though he'd been out of town at the time. And then this happens. Oh my god, the mannequin parts are attacking him! Call off your mannequins, Gerald! Call them off! It was me. So why was the fashion designer afraid of the mannequin? Because it was armed. There are plenty of episodes about technology, and those are always wonderful because they can be disputed so easily. A woman buys her husband a new used computer for his birthday, and he sets it up right away. He is intoxicated by the magic of Excel. I just want to make spreadsheets. After shutting it down for the night, the computer comes back on by itself and an image of a pharaoh appears on the screen. Honey, and Carta is possessed again. The computer keeps turning on by itself and while a PC repair guy is examining it, an email pops up despite the fact that the modem isn't set up. He checks the message, sees a bunch of hieroglyphics, then one fades into a message that says, help me. They reply, somehow, and get an email back right away from Dr. Statler who is on a dig in Egypt and is trapped in a tomb. I'll call the State Department and have them get in touch with the Egyptian embassy. How is this her first instinct? Like, who in the world knows what to do or who to call when you get an email from a guy saying he's trapped in a tomb? Here's the kicker. When they ask the doctor how much battery is left on his laptop, he says, I have no computer. Wait, can we just look at this screen for a second? What happens when you hit read on this email? I doubt it's a marked as red button. And why is the send button not grayed out? What are you gonna send? Lies, fiction. Yeah, this one is so demonstrably untrue, it doesn't even test your imagination at all. The UI is fake, they didn't have access to the internet, and the main character passes up sex to look at formulas. I don't buy it. Does the mind have enough power to send out a signal that could be received through cyberspace? Is there such a thing as ESP mail? Oh my god. The show definitely adheres to the truth is stranger than fiction theory and for the most part it checks out. The weirdest stories don't tend to be made up because who in the hell would write some of these? You can't make this stuff up. Here's an example of one of the factual stories. I'm just gonna come out and say it. It's about a haunted bucket. Every week, a dairy farmer named Gus delivers milk in an old dented bucket to a small family. Suddenly, on a dark and stormy night, the bucket starts shaking violently and making weird noises. The bucket is empty. Dad blames it on the storm, which makes no sense, but it's either that or bucket gremlins. It stops for a moment and the family has a good laugh, but then... <laughs> oh God, here it comes. It's, it's gonna get us. Just... Look out! I know, I'll just put this in my truck. Put on your seatbelt now. Dad drives the bucket back to Gus. He finds him unconscious on the ground. He had a stroke that would have killed him, but thanks to that crazy bucket, he found him and saved his life. Again, I want to reiterate that this is one of the stories marked as fact. Did the story of the exploding milk bucket really happen? A similar story did take place. What, that's it? No explanation? How am I supposed to cross-reference or read about the original story? We just end abruptly with fact. Bucket went wild. It didn't take me long to realize that the stories labeled as fact are fluffed up to be a little more dramatic. Just because they're labeled as true doesn't mean every detail was accurate. A good example is the story about a woman who was in a terrible plane incident where part of the roof is ripped off. This did actually happen on Aloha Airlines Flight 243. There was one fatality and the plane did land. Though that's not how this story is told. There's some added absurdity. The woman telling it says she was protected by an angel disguised as a stewardess. And I suppose somebody could feel that way and tell that story, but there's no way to prove it's true. A lot of the ghost stories are like this. They're labeled as fact, but only because somebody said it happened, not because it really did. So it's hard to take some of these truthful ones seriously because they don't really match their source. That's why Frakes doesn't go into too much detail at the end, and there is never a reasonable explanation on the table, even though some of these stories could have one. Instead of asking practical questions like, is this a coincidence? Maybe the person thought they saw a ghost but 
was mistaken or high as fuck. It goes more like, what could have caused this strange incident? Was there an alien? Maybe telekinesis? Or nine ghosts that caused this guy to find Elvis Presley's motorcycle in his farm shed? Let's talk about the show's main host, Jonathan Frakes. While the tales are pretty fun, some even bordering on spooky, his presentation is what really makes this show fun to watch. He's always walking onto the set between every tale. His stories are broken apart by these cheesy lighting effects and sound effects. And the editing is kind of a wonderful disaster. The camera stays on Frakes just a few frames too many, and it's delightfully awkward. After every tale, Frakes ends on a pun related to the subject, and I think there are times where I swear he is smiling so damn hard he is literally straining his mouth. I think... I think he thinks these puns are funny. Sometimes I think his reaction is so genuine that he must be reading them off the prompter for the first time and that's why he's so amused. Either that or dad jokes just never get tiring to this guy. The set design is lovely, even though it's limited. I always manage to spot a lamp that I fall in love with. There's some cool candles and desks, and look at this. Welcome to Golden Girls Game of Thrones. God, it's so bad. It's like the perfect crappy anthology you can just watch when you're feeling a little blue or just want to be told some creepy and hilarious stories about ghosts, mannequins, and doctors trapped in tombs. I can't recommend this series enough, if only to see Frakes charm the camera. I can't think of a better way to end this than with a pun montage or a puntage, as I like to call it. Enjoy some friendly interrogation, and until next time, stay spooky. Are we telling you a true story of real substance, or are we just barking at the moon? Is this story an admirable retelling of an actual event, or is it really nothing to crow about? Are we giving you a straight deal here, or do you think we're really bluffing? Did we program the truth in this tale, or is it merely garbage in, garbage out? Do you think this mysterious tale of the grave marker of fleeting lie? Is it carved in stone? How did that happen? <laughs> Hey everyone, thanks for watching my video on Beyond Belief Factor Fiction. I hope you enjoyed my commentary and passion for bizarre mystery series. I have more videos to suggest, but first a huge thank you to my patrons who continue to support me even when my video topics get a little weird. Consider supporting my channel by donating a small amount of money, and if you can't or don't want to, likes, shares, and comments are totally free and they make my day. If you want to see more videos by yours truly, here's a suggestion. On the right, we have an episode from one of my flagship series, That Time on Murder, She Wrote. And on the left, I have a parody of this show from Neil Ciceriga's YouTube channel. I think you'll really enjoy it. Thanks again, and as always, I'll see you in the next one.